I'm Jeff Glor from CBS Saturday Morning. Welcome to The Dish. Today we're exploring a variety of southern cuisine from Nashville's hot chicken to Nola's beignets. First up, Philadelphia. Though not below the Mason-Dixon line, Michelle Miller found out this restaurant's soul food is second to none. At South Jazz Club, it's about harmony and improvisation. On stage and in the kitchen, an experience carefully crafted by brothers Benjamin and Robert Bynum, complete with a modern take on classic Southern dishes. What is soul food to you? I think every culture has soul food, and I think it's something that evokes warm feelings, childhood memories, um, time spent with family. I was treated to a feast reminiscent of my grandmother's table with dishes like seafood stew, deviled eggs, red rice, and brown sugar pineapple bread pudding. In all the years I've done dishes, I don't think I've ever had this much food plated <laughs> for me. I gotta dig in. This red rice is so delicious. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Mm. Oh my gosh. Benjamin, who has formal culinary training, tries to make these dishes as healthy as possible. Ben used to be a smoker. How did you know that? Um. I quit because I began to feel the effects of smoking. And the effects of unhealthy eating. So he decided his soul food menu needed a diet too. This food is traditional soul food, but it, it's rather light. The stereotype of Southern food is, is fried chicken and catfish. I wouldn't have felt right not to do one of those dishes since it is something that is part of what we do and it's something that is part of our history and our culture. But there are certainly methods and ways to cook food that's full of flavor that, you know, you're not pushing the envelope with your cholesterol and everything, but I'm not going to lie to you, it's a lot of cheese and butter yeah, and cream there and is, mac and cheese. There is no getting around the mac and cheese. Mm. Benjamin invited me into the kitchen to make one of South's popular dishes, the blue crab toast. We're going to make the lemon caper ravigote. It's a fancy way for saying lemon horseradish mayonnaise. Horseradish, scallions, mustard, lemon juice, mayo, and lump crab meat on toasted brioche. And then we have our avocado and with so lemon juice, salt, okay. pepper. And we take that and we just do a nice little That's our blue crab toast. There it is, check that out. Look at this. I did it all by myself. <laughs> you enjoy a nice, uh, a nice evening of, of dinner and then come next door into the jazz club to listen to a set of music. The front of the house is Robert's domain. The Wharton grad mimics the 60 year career of his late father, Benjamin Bynum Sr. He owned the Cadillac Club, which later became Impulse, hosting the likes of Aretha Franklin, Nina Simone, and Fats Domino. When you think about your dad's club and what it meant mm -hmm. to the folks who were employed there, to the community that it served, what was it that it provided that no place else could? The impulse was at Broad in Germantown, which might be considered to be a, a low-income area, and he made a commitment to the community to have a place that was upscale, elegant, and treated people um, in a manner that they um, might not be treated every place. So they really felt like it was a refuge within the community. So service was really yeah. important to your family. Very much so. I mean, it was a, a safe haven kind of for us. Um, you know, we grew up at that time, uh, it was in the heart of North Philadelphia, it used to be called Yorktown. Um, it was uh, a challenging area, but I think that um, it was a place where people enjoyed getting dressed up and going, which was a little bit uh, unusual for those times. Since 1990, the brothers picked up the reins with six restaurants in Philadelphia, including Zanzibar Blue, open from 1990 to 2007. You opened the club when jazz was on the decline. How much part of keeping that tradition alive was Zanzibar Blue? Philadelphia has a rich jazz tradition, and we felt like things had begun to slide a little bit. So we were very committed to, pre to presenting um, upscale, uh, environment with really big names. We did Lou Rawls, we did Chick Corea, we've done Jimmy Scott, we've done Nancy Wilson. So we were really committed to bringing back jazz to the city of Philadelphia. Benjamin Bynum Sr. also worked with his sons at their longest running eatery, Warm Daddy's. 
He died at the age of 98. He uh, handled our door at Warm Daddy's for, for many, many years. Um, he only stopped probably a, a year or so before he passed away. And he was very much our rock. He was very much who we relied on to bounce ideas off and to be supportive of what we were doing. So it was a loss, but we still have his legacy to hold on to. The brothers decided to close Warm Daddy's during the pandemic, but continue to serve up food and music at Relish and here at South, the ultimate celebration of their father's legacy. We've been fortunate to have a very loyal clientele that supports us at all of our venues, so that's something that has uh, been reassuring for us. After the break, we peek into a Top Chef's Alabama kitchen. This is The Dish. Many of us might agree, Southern classics are as delicious as is. But as Jamie Wax found out, Chef Kelsey Clark has a flair for adding a twist to the traditional. Fried chicken and champagne is definitely like the last meal I would eat before I die, probably. Maybe throw some caviar on there, just in case. Why not? Of all the many places Chef Kelsey Barnard Clark has cooked, the very finest meal you might get is in her favorite spot, her home. But what a beautiful southern home you Thank have Thank you. Here. It's where we sat down to an opulent spread of southern cuisine. Sweet corn with paprika, cheese, and citrus. Southern biscuits. Shrimp with succotash. Deviled eggs, playfully called wicked chickens. One time someone made a joke to me. They said, do you know why we call them wicked chickens? I was like, no. And they said, because wicked chickens make the best deviled eggs. I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I am a huge deviled egg fan. This is by far one of the very most delicious I've ever had. The smokiness of the brisket, mm -hmm. and then the brininess of the okra, and then you've got a hit of pimento cheese, which is just perfect. It creates this profile that is a deviled egg, but it's, it's so much more. You can't get more classic Southern than okra and pimento cheese. The other thing I notice about your cooking is it's not just the profile of these foods that are beautiful, but it's so much about texture. A lot of Southern recipes lack herbs, they lack acid, and they lack texture. A lot of times you'll see me adding crunchy things and there's always herbs on everything I do. I'm a big, big fan of herbs. This is one of my favorite meals, mm -hmm. like to eat personally. I ate it for lunch yesterday, I was making it actually. It's succotash, and then I love shrimp so much, mm -hmm. so you top it with shrimp. If there was a dish to kind of describe me, it would probably be this and a hallmark of Southern cuisine, perfectly fried chicken. This was top to me. All right, I can't wait, because I'm... Mm. You hear that? That's what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I mean, so juicy. And it's, it's so beautifully crispy and fried, it's that marriage where you can't tell where the skin ends and the crust begins. Clark grew up in Alabama, showing an interest in food at a very early age. After graduating from the Culinary Institute of America, she began cooking in some of the most respected kitchens in New York. When I was working at Cafe Balloud, I was responsible for family meal, which in our mm -hmm. industry is cooking for each other, right? I was working under Gavin Kaysen, and he was executive chef, and he was like, I want you to cook your food. Quit cooking everybody else's, cook your food. And I was like, oh, okay, I gotta cook gumbo. I called my mom, I was like, what's the gumbo recipe? I don't remember. So she had to type it out, and I cooked gumbo, and then it, it just was one of those things. I, I would just remember making the roux in that kitchen being kind of going, this is crazy, and why didn't I ever write this down? This is a, a moment every single Southern home chef will relate to in this yes. story right now. Yeah. After her time in New York, with everywhere to choose from, she chose to continue her vision back home in Dothan, Alabama. My plan was to go to New Orleans, and so I was coming home for just a breather because I was burnt out, truly. I said, you know what, I'm gonna cater for a little bit because the caterer that I'd worked for, he was my mentor, and he had passed away, and there was this huge void for fine dining catering here. And, you know, rest is history. Mm -hmm. Didn't leave, I ended <laughs> up getting here. I was fully booked for a year in about a month, and there was just this, wow. oh yeah. And I, I had this moment of like, why am I so acting like I'm so against my town when they are so unbelievably supportive of me? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's just where this all started. Order up, Hayden. From there, she opened her restaurant, KBC. 
You know, when I was in high school, we didn't, there was nothing, not a single business here. And Attracting when, other businesses to a now downtown. thriving downtown. I mean, this downtown area and this main street survived the pandemic. Yes, which is, I mean, what a blessing to even have, be able to say that. My restaurant survived it, um, which most of my friends didn't. When the opportunity came to compete on Top Chef, it meant she had to leave behind her husband and then 10-month-old son for the duration. The sacrifice paid off, and Clark took home the big prize. Kelsey, you are Top Chef. I think for me, it was it was a life lesson more than it was about the food, and, and it was just a wonderful experience, because when in your life do you get to go somewhere and anyone you've ever respected, admired, wanted to learn from mm -hmm. is actually doing it with you for 10 weeks. All right. This is your last two. And she's used the exposure she got from her win to spread the message that Southern cooking and hospitality should be inclusive of everyone. It is incredibly important for me at KBC. It, it is always a perfect picture of what culture should look like. And I think that that's the really cool thing about this new era we're in. Is Southern hospitality reaching farther than we thought it would reach? Is it important to you that you're a major voice in that? Oh, it is probably the most important thing to me. The lessons and recipes she's drawn from Southern culture are now the basis for her new cookbook, Southern Grit. And I've been a collector of cookbooks since I was 12 years old. So that's really what I always think back on when I see this book now on my shelf with all the other ones. I'm like, whoa, I wrote a book, I wrote a cookbook. Someone's reading this. You know, you don't want a ton of breading, but it's breaded enough when it's no longer wet. The most fun thing about cooking is teaching people really and annoying. hopefully inspiring someone to love to cook one day. And for Clark, staying inspired herself is everything. I haven't even gotten started yet, is how I really feel. To me, there's never like a stopping point. You gotta keep getting better and pushing yourself and learning more and gotta keep going. Finding a new thing and then getting really good at it. And that's sort of always my goal. Being in the moment. Being in the moment and never settling for just now. What would a Southern food show be without a bite of fried chicken? Jan Crawford visits some Nashville chicken joints that put the hot in hot spots. At Hattie B's in Nashville, the line goes down the block for what once was the city's best kept secret, hot chicken. Uh, can I get the large dark plate, uh, hot? I'm gonna have uh, the tenders, but I want them hot. It's an addictive combination of pleasure and pain. Fried chicken doused in cayenne and enough spices to make you sweat. Wait, your eyes are watering. Ooh. It's because he doesn't do that. <laughs> I, let me tell you, yeah, I don't know if this is a good move or not. That's father and son owners Nick Bishop and Nick Jr. And I'm going to start hiccups here in just a minute. <laughs> They fry up their chicken five ways, including hot, damn hot, and shut the cluck up. Why do you think people want to eat things that cause them pain? You kind of get high from it. High? <laughs> really? Local legend has it hot chicken started more than 80 years ago with the family of this woman, Andre Prince Jeffries. Of course it started with a woman. <laughs> of course. My great uncle, Thornton Prince, being, as they say, a womanizer. A womanizer who was cheating on his girlfriend. So she decided revenge was a dish best served hot and added some spices to his fried chicken. But this woman was angry. So she wanted to let him know. So she dashed something on that chicken. But he liked it. He did. And then that was the beginning. I, we assume that was the beginning, but it's so sad that we don't know who she was. But her legacy lives on. Great Uncle Thornton started a restaurant using the girlfriend's recipe, and Prince's Hot Chicken Shack still packs them in. Number 48, number 54. These days, there's competition even what from some of the big boys. His KFC spicy, smoky, crispy Nashville hot chicken tenders. 
And for those with a stomach of steel, there's the death row chicken at Big Shakes. Cooks actually have to wear gas masks, and brave participants in its regular death row challenge must sign a waiver. You can start now. It's no gimmick. Even a few bites burn. But on the night we were there, comedian Chad Ryden kept asking for more, chewing his way to victory. There was a guy here who had like three bites and, and had to run out. Amateur. That's just sad. That's sad. Why, why did he even come? But if he's an amateur, what does that make you? Uh, an idiot. And maybe that's why, when it comes to taking the heat, Andre Prince Jeffries, the matriarch of the place that started it all, has a confession. So you made all these different um, levels. You right. Know, so which one do you like? Mild. Mild? <laughs> you like the mild. I can't tolerate anything hot. <laughs> Coming up, what better way to end an episode than with a sugary snack? We'll take you to a renowned cafe in New Orleans, next on The Dish. Sweet treats usually come at the end of the meal, right? But if you've ever been to New Orleans, you know they do things a little differently in the Big Easy. Dana Jacobson went to the famed eatery Cafe Du Monde that's serving up beignets 24 hours a day. It's the New Orleans party, open to all. Cafe Du Monde. It's green and white awning on Decatur Street, as famous as its lines. This lady would like an order of beignets. Can you take care of her for me? Here you go. Thank you. Enjoy. Which are always worth the wait. Come on down this way. I don't way. think this beignet is gonna make it to the table. That's all right, that's why I give you three. You have two more to go when we get there. Two more pieces of pastry and powdered sugar perfection. Cafe Du Monde's signature beignets. Do you know how many calories are in one? Mm, I don't think we, we don't count calories in New Orleans. That's you know, we are a food <laughs> city and, and calories don't count. We I, check them at the board. I like that. <laughs> True or not, the beignets are a French Quarter staple, made and served fresh. The recipe basics, rolled dough, cut into squares, tossed into the fryer by hand, then coated in the white stuff. Is there a way to make the perfect beignet? The biggest thing is, is when you roll it out and then put it in the oil, you want to make sure the oil is hot enough, because that's what's going to get it to puff up. And the secret to keeping the powdered sugar, at least until I dump it all over myself, basically, well, on the beignet is just when they're hot? When they're hot, you put it on, and if you can sift it, you know, to do something to get it on a smooth coat, and, yeah. and then when you're biting the beignet, is don't breathe in or breathe out. It's just kind of hold your breath and, and go for it. Mm. Yep, there goes the sugar. Mm. How do you not love that? <laughs> oh, my God. I know I look ridiculous right now. No, not at all. We like that look. Oh. After a few more bites... Kind of use your fingers a little bit to separate them. I tried my hands at making some. And Try to keep go. the shape. And found it's not as easy as it looks. Put it in, but don't put it in with too much force. The oil is very hot. <laughs> uh, close, and then we just, just keep it a little push. You got <laughs> so afraid of yeah, that well, oil. I mean, that's good. That's what I want everybody afraid of, that oil. I <laughs> missed my first free throw. There I can do that's it on okay. the second. That's okay. You'll do better. <laughs> yeah, you did. I, I think I was a little afraid. All right, so this... Oh my there you gosh! Go. Very close. Or the third. But now I understand why they're all. Uh, there, there you go. Yeah. Perfect. You'll get everything you need. Jay Roman has been Good. surrounded by beignets his entire life. His grandfather, Hubert Fernandez, bought Cafe Du Monde in 1942. It's been their family legacy ever since. I have a 15-month-old uh, granddaughter who is getting ready to eat her first beignet. Uh, her mom is, you know, making her grow a couple more teeth before she lets her gather, but she will be taking her first bite of a beignet shortly. I'm thinking about you as a young kid running around with powdered sugar all over you. This had to be a dream come true. It was perfect. We enjoyed, you know, it was okay until you got to the old enough and then they made you sweep the floor. But even working had its benefits. My daughter graduated from Tulane just a few years ago. She in an it. industry known for keeping those in it away from family, at Cafe Du Monde, they continue to be surrounded by it. 
I got to go to work with dad or I got to go to work with my uncles. You know, that was something I looked forward to doing. So I always tried when my kids were growing up to not tell them this is what they were going to do. You know, let them see for themselves it is something they wanted. And now? Now they do. I had two children. Both of them are working in the business and doing well with it. The family isn't the only thing intertwined with Café Du Monde. So is New Orleans itself. People talk about New Orleans as the gumbo pot, you know, a, yeah. a mixture of a whole lot of things. And we're just very proud to be one of the one of the ingredients in that pot. With a history that dates back to 1862, it's no wonder. That's when Café Du Monde began as a coffee stand in what's now the French market. The chicory coffee it served, the same you get today. Chicory is the root of the endive, which is a lettuce, and that is roasted and ground and mixed with the coffee. The original settlers to New Orleans had very short supplies. The trick they used to stretch their supplies was to add the, the endive to the coffee. It develops its own taste, and the taste stuck. Why did your grandfather decide that he had to buy Café Du Monde? You know, he just sat across the street. Again, you got to remember, 1942, this wasn't, uh, there wasn't a lot of tourism in New yeah. Orleans in 1942, but he just had a vision. From coffee stand to cafe to 10 locations around New Orleans, there's even merchandise and shipping nationwide. But when in the Crescent City, the original Decatur Street location is the must-visit spot, not only for tourists. One of the times Bill Clinton was here in New Orleans and he was getting ready to leave, was driving my kids to school, and they were on the radio saying he's late, you know, but he must be going for beignets at Cafe de Mon. And with that, my cell phone rang, and it was my guy downtown saying the Secret Service is here. Even with the celebrity status and the growth, Cafe du Monde remains true to its roots. We have one food product, you know, the beignets, that's it. It's and a really good yeah, food it is, product. Well, we, we hope so, but I mean, it is, it is our only food product. The Cafe Lait is with milk. The beverages for, for a number of years when I was growing up, we had coffee and we had cold milk. And then over the years, we've expanded a little bit. People have developed taste for iced coffee and frozen coffee. And, but still, it's a very simple menu. Is it tempting in what this world has become in food to get the gluten-free beignet or the no sugar added? It's, you get people with requests all the time for the gluten-free and can you sell sandwiches and can you do this and can you do that? Why? I mean, when you do something well, when you continue to do it and, and people seem to enjoy it, you know, we, we just stick with what you do best, I think. Café Du Monde does that 24-7, 364, with the original location only scheduled to be closed Christmas Day. And while the doors have been shut by hurricanes like Katrina, and more recently with the pandemic, Roman says opening them back up is also a part of that family tradition. Looking at this and having all these people enjoy them, some for the first time. Does that ever get old for you? No, it never gets old. It makes it worth getting up every morning to see everything, all the happy faces of some of the young children eating their first beignet. It, it makes it all worthwhile. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Jeff Glor. Thank you for watching The Dish.